with very few exceptions, every witness called by the January 6th committee has been not only a Republican, but somebody in Donald's inner circle, somebody in the Oval Office, in the West Wing, in the executive branch, people who were, at least in some measure, his allies, his supporters. It's one of the uh, strokes of genius of this committee to do that. And we've learned that these people, people like C Pat Cipollone uh, and many of the other White House lawyers, considered themselves team normal. And that was in contradistinction to team crazy. These sort of non-governmental actors who were allowed almost complete access to the White House by Donald, people like Rudy Giuliani. And this week's winner of the Dunning-Kruger Effect Award, Sidney Powell, and also people like Ginny Thomas, uh, people who had no business being anywhere near the White House, let alone the Oval Office. What is fascinating to me is how clueless these people who consider themselves team normal really are. Remember, uh, in real time, they knew what was going on. They knew how bad the situation was. They knew for months, if not years, that Donald was an out of control, unfit, completely incompetent child who had no business having any power at all, let alone the power of the Oval Office. And yet, they said nothing. They had ample opportunities. They had opportunities after the election when it was clear that Donald had lost and he had lost badly to speak out against this big lie. They had opportunities to uh, speak to the impeachment managers for Donald's second impeachment. They said nothing. Many of them did not come forward voluntarily. They had to be subpoenaed by the committee in order to offer their testimony. Whether or not they're normal, whatever that means, in terms of how they live their day-to-day -day lives, in contrast to team crazy, they are not team sane or team normal. They're team complicit. Because if they had spoken out when they should have, when it might have mattered, things never would have gotten this far. So these are not heroes. These aren't even people who did their jobs, for God's sakes. So let's be grateful that they have finally been forced to tell the truth. But let's never forget that Team Complicit is just as responsible for all this nightmare we're living in as Team Crazy ever was. Congresswoman Liz Cheney has been doing a phenomenal job uh, as vice chair of the January 6th Select Committee. And um, I, I don't think that that should go unnoticed. She seems also particularly r to relish her role as the person um, most willing to poke at Donald. She reminded us that he's a 76-year-old man. He is not a child. She, or what did she say? He's not an impressionable child. Um, he knows the difference between right and wrong. All of this is true. I'm glad she's pointing it out. I'm glad she's not pulling any punches. Um, I have some concerns about her willingness to protect people like Jenny Thomas, but uh, we'll just have to see how that plays out. I just want to remind everybody, though, uh, now that we seem to be in the mood to make heroes of people who are simply doing their fucking jobs, like Mike Pence and... Um, Cassidy Hutchinson, Liz Cheney is somebody who, at every opportunity, has voted against the Voting Rights Act. That is anti-democratic, and it's anti-American. She's also somebody who often and vociferously goes out and tells her constituents that Democrats are murdering babies after they're born. That's how pro-life she is. She has to lie about what is really happening. So listen, I'm happy to have her on our side 
in this one very narrow sense, but let's please never forget who this woman is. One of the most remarkable things that was revealed at yesterday's January 6th Select Committee hearing was a text exchange between Brad Parscale, Donald's 2016 campaign manager, and Katrina Pearson, a campaign advisor. Parscale started by texting Pearson about what was happening on January 6th. And he, he wrote, this is about Trump, Donald, obviously, pushing for uncertainty in this country. A sitting president asking for civil war. This week, I feel guilty for helping him win. Now, just as an aside, one of the shocking things about that is that Brad Car Parscale is capable of feeling guilt. Um, and it's, uh, that's one of the reasons it was so shocking. I mean, he's done terrible things and he was all in with Donald and yet finally he had this moment of remorse and this moment of insight into what was actually happening. Pearson, maybe just to make him feel better at the time, I don't know, uh, responded, you did what you felt right at the time and therefore it was right. By the way, I don't really think that's how it works. It's just because you felt it was right doesn't mean it was right, but maybe she's just comforting a friend. Parscale responds, yeah, but a woman is dead and Pearson responds, you do realize this was going to happen. Okay. Uh, and he responds, yeah, if I was Trump and knew my rhetoric killed somebody, she says it wasn't the rhetoric. He finishes the text conversation by writing Katrina. Yeah, it was. So, I don't think we could expect Katrina Pearson, uh, a woman who is perfectly comfortable sporting a necklace made out of spent AR-15 shells, but Parscale's comments show us just how bad things must have been for somebody so, who's so deeply entrenched in Donald's world was finally shocked into awareness that not only were things terrible, but that his boss was directly responsible for what was going on, for the deaths that were occurring, for the violence, for the viciousness. Of course, a day later, Parscale felt the need to uh, email Donald, for whom he still works, by the way, and apologize because the worst fucking thing you can do if you're in Donald's orbit is tell the truth. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, a video was released of what happened in the hallways of Robb Elementary School for 77 minutes um, during the shooting uh, in Uvalde, Texas. It is one of the most harrowing things I've ever seen in my life, even though there's nothing graphic about it. There's, there's no blood. Uh, we don't see the results of what happened in that classroom, thankfully. But it's harrowing because we had, I don't even know how many, over 10, maybe over 20 men armed to the teeth covered in body armor, some of them with ballistic shields, running around like a bunch of idiots who don't seem to know what they're there for. They're hiding behind corners. They're running up and down the hallway with no purpose. Some of them who got closer to the room, the classroom where the gunman was slaughtering 19 children under the age of 10 and two teachers, ran as fast as they could away from the shooter as soon as shots were fired. It's literally as if firefighters ran away from the flames. I have never seen a more clear example that completely torpedoes the whole good guy with a gun argument for why America, all Americans need to be armed to the teeth. I think we can finally put that one to rest. Um, unless, you know, you think that taking a minute to 
use hand sanitizer is the sign of a good cop. I don't know, but it's really the one of the most despicable things. I hope none of these people ever has a good night's sleep again. And the fact that any of them still has a job is yet another indictment of our law enforcement system in this country. They can't protect us. They are, seem incapable of protecting us. So now they want to arm teachers. And what's even worse is some manufacturer, the CEO of which must be a sociopath, there's no other explanation for this, has just, uh, is starting to push uh, on schools the idea of putting in their classrooms these bulletproof, airtight closets that are designed, <laughs> uh, you know, the horrors, the horrors that are being inflicted on us. And, and don't get me wrong, none of this, none of this is accidental. Anyway, the whole point of these things is to, to shove children into them in case of an active shooter, lock them in, and just, I don't know, I guess have them sit in there until the, the shooter's been neutralized. Yes, let's do that instead of get rid of semi-automatic weapons. Let's do that instead of keeping weapons of war out of the hands of people as young as 18. Let's just keep terrorizing our children and their parents on a daily basis because you fucking psychos are so much more concerned about your guns than you are about anything else. The fact that we have one party, 100% of whom is okay with this, it's one of the biggest problems we are facing now and in the future. And you know what? Holding Donald accountable, holding the Republicans who supported him accountable isn't going to change that. So we really need to figure this one out. The only way we change this, the only way we stop terrorizing generations of children is to vote these fucking people out of office. After months of keeping their relationship secret, uh, it's been revealed that the actor Bradley Cooper and Huma Abedin, uh, Hillary Clinton's closest advisor for many, many years, are in a relationship. Uh, they were set up by Anna Wintour, and things seem to be going swimmingly. So I think that Huma Abedin is totally out of Bradley Cooper's league, but good for him and really good for her because hopefully she's finally getting somebody who's worthy of her. So congratulations, and it's really nice to have some good news for a change. Mm -hmm.